Hello, party people, and welcome to downtown Vancouver. I am in Canada for pgconf.dev. It's a conference where Postgres developers get together and decide what they're going to do for the next year uh, developing Postgres. It's been really, you might say to yourself, Brent, you're not a uh, Postgres developer, and you would be correct. I am not even a developer of any way, shape, or means. Um, but I wanted to come here out of really professional curiosity. I just wanted to know what it was like to see them build Postgres. Like, what, how, how's that planning and all that work? Because it's open source, just a bunch of people who do the things that they want to do. And it's really interesting to see the way that they do it. The first couple of days of the conference are sessions that are 50 minutes long where developers who have an interest in building something are presenting and basically saying, here's what I've built so far, here's why I think it should go into Postgres, here's the help that I need in order to get this across the finish line. That's the first couple of days. So it's really interesting to basically hear sales pitches from different developers who have a business need to accomplish something. Um, then the last day of the conference is an unconference where everybody gets together and they propose things on Post-it notes and propose, you know, here are the things that I would like to talk about so then they can network with each other and figure out how they're going to strategize this work for the coming year. It's really interesting. I blogged about it over at smartpostgres.com. Uh, but I've got some time in the morning here before the next round of sessions start on day two. So I thought I'd go through your top voted questions from PollGab. Let's see the top voted questions from Paul who says, Hi, Brent. Can you give me some examples of how check constraints are used by the optimizer? Yeah. Very often, uh, people want to make sure bad data doesn't go into the database. They'll say things like, well, this column is technically a tiny integer, but we really only accept the numbers 1, 2, and 3. So a check constraint helps SQL Server check that data on the way into the database. A less useful aspect of it is getting data on the way out. If user says, well, you know, assuming that the valid data are only or valid options are only one, two, and three, if the user says, show me the data where this value equals four, SQL Server can look at the check constraint and say, oh, there's no data that matches four. We'll just go ahead and not return anything. And it can short circuit past executing the query. I have never had a system or a, a scenario where that got me across the finish line. But I have had a lot of success with check constraints on inserts, updates, and deletes preventing bad data, especially when uh, people used to use foreign key relationships and they were joining over to tables that became uh, very contentious due to locking. Well, if you have a config table that, say, stores the states of the United States and you want to make sure that only valid states are being used on customer rows, well, you could just as easily use a check constraint and you could have a hard-coded list of values. Here are the names of the United States states. It's not like that changes very often. So constraints uh, can be higher performant there since they don't have to join over to the related tables. Uh, when do you want to do that? Uh, so typically the times when you want to do that is when you're looking at sustained inserts updates uh, that are, say, over a thousand per second sustained um, or you're trying to hit bursts of 10,000 or 100,000, using check constraints instead of foreign keys can get you higher throughput. Uh, next up, let's see, Radek says, can you explain why uh, high weights on parallelism uh, can be a problem? Sure. The easy way to, to see it is if you have a query where when it goes parallel by default, it actually runs slower than if you throw an option max stop one hint on there. Now, this doesn't happen often. It's fairly unusual. But if you want to see the kinds of scenarios where that's a problem, you can go to my Mastering Query Tuning class where I give you examples of those, give you examples of where parallel ver versions of the query actually run slower than single-threaded versions of the query. So now that is an extreme case. Uh, there are cases where just even regular, like four or eight threaded queries can be uh, slower than two threaded queries, for example. But you wanted a quick example. That's the quickest one I could give. Uh, next up, Ricardo says, my secret sauce as a database administrator was getting sophisticated work done through the GUI. 
He says, now with the Azure portal, Databricks, etc., the GUI seems to change daily. Do you think that the days of using the GUI are numbered? Um, uh, no, um, I think you just have to keep up with it. I think you just have to keep up with the changes. These days in technology, things are moving pretty quickly. And, and we were lucky with SQL Server that you could do roughly the same work for the last 10, 15, 20 years. And you could use SQL Server Management Studio and it wasn't changing. It was kind of frozen in molasses. Uh, th these days, your work is changing in technology faster and you just have to learn to keep up. I know it sucks. That's why I'm here at a conference because I got to learn too. Uh, next up, uh, Tibbler. Tibbler says, hi, imagine that you have complex structured data in a database. You'd like to archive it for the long term and structure should be preserved. Would you recommend a database for this purpose? Um, so it really, when you say structured data in a database, what people often mean by that is they're putting stuff like XML or JSON data in the database. Because really, tables are structured data. So it depends on what you're asking me. If you're saying that you have tables in a database and you want to archive it, sure, just use another database. Just move the data into another database on another server. But if you have JSON I would or XML, I would argue that probably a relational database wasn't the right place to put it to begin with. That it probably should have either been in a file system, because after all, they're XML files or JSON files means they go in a file system or in a key value system, but a relational database is usually the right place for those. You can, it's just really expensive, and I want you to be cheap. Uh, next up, Ricardo asks, when I'm performance tuning a query, what ballpark figures uh, do I use relate for time related to rows returned? For example, what's a reasonable amount of time to return 200,000 rows? The way that I explain that to users, if someone brings me a query and it returns 200,000 rows, the first thing that I say is, wait a minute, are you sitting in front of the screen waiting for 200,000 rows to appear? Are you actually reading those? What you want is the hit song from Rod Stewart back in the 1990s, Pagination, woo, do, 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 do. Pagination. You want to return rows, say, 100 at a time so that you can actually get to start working on whatever those uh, re report output uh, needs that you have are. Just like if you go to Google or Amazon and you search for something, you don't really expect to see 200,000 rows on a page, do you? That's not really realistic. And if you did expect to see 200,000 rows on a page, I'd like you to find a page on Google or Amazon where you can actually do that. Now, once we come back to reality and they're willing to accept pagination, woo, then you can talk about how realistic it is to wait for, say, 100 rows. Sure, in that case, you probably want those to happen within a matter of seconds. But if someone says, no, I'm actually waiting for 200,000 rows, I'm like, okay, go get yourself a cup of coffee, chief, because I'm not performance tuning for that. You're going to wait 30, 60, 90 seconds or whatever it is because I don't have a fast way to deliver 200,000 rows. People don't like hearing that. People don't like hearing a lot of things that I say, but that's okay. That's where you steer them towards pagination. Woo! Ozan asks, hi, Brown. When I'm using SQL query stress with enough threads and iterations to get thread pool weights, I still see some worker threads available after I sum up uh, active worker counts in DMOS schedulers. How's that possible? Unfortunately, me troubleshooting your demo probably isn't realistic for me to do over a Q&A format like this. If you want to do it, I actually use that exact technique in my mastering server tuning class in the thread pool module, and I show you how to reproduce it. I do it live, and I crash my SQL, effectively crash my SQL server. Um, so that if you want to learn how to reproduce that, that's the place that I would go. Um, if you are trying to reproduce it uh, using the exact scripts from my Mastering Server Tuning class and you're having problems, leave a comment on that module along with what you're trying to do, and then we can go into deeper troubleshooting there. But I just can't do it here with the tiny amount of, of Q&A back and forth space that we have on PollGab. And then finally, Andrew asks, how uh, transferable is Oracle DBA experience towards the SQL Server stack? 
I'm reviewing job applications for my team, and we have a few applicants with years of Oracle experience. Are those concepts equivalent or uh, transferable? If you see someone with a lot of experience doing, say, Oracle work or Postgres or MySQL, that means that they've demonstrated the ability to learn how to do those tasks. That in and of itself is valuable. It's valuable knowing that someone can check off a bunch of steps and get to a finish line. Is any of their knowledge actually useful? That's iffy at best. And I can tell you firsthand from switching back and forth to doing Postgres stuff, for example, the things that are best practices on one database system are not at all best practices on another. Theory might be like people shouldn't have more security than they need, but actual execution of any of that, you're really starting again from scratch. All right, that's a good place for me to stop. Now I have to go get my learn on down there. I have to go uh, hike about uh, five blocks. Uh, Vancouver's a really pretty city. It's uh, really nice and charming. I got really lucky with the sun here today. It's uh, or this week. It was rainy the first day, but then it's been sun uh, ever after. Um, and then uh, going out tonight to have dinner with Blythe Morrow, a name that some of you might recognize from the past days, the past summit days. She uh, used to work for Pass and then started her own marketing company. So we're doing dinner down here to go catch up. So I will go head out for the day. Hope y'all had fun and learned something. And I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.